Gimel Tammuz is coming up. What's Gimel Tammuz? It's the day when we were no longer able to hear and see the Rebbe. I'm sure you observed that I didn't use a term that many people would have used, the day of his passing or any other similar expression. I deliberately avoided using that because for me and for multitudes of other Jews, the Rebbe is still here. And what we're going to talk about in the series of talks and conversations about the Rebbe is stories about the Rebbe before Gimbal Tammuz, as well as stories about the Rebbe after Gimbal Tammuz. And I have with me a very good friend, a therapist, a very noted therapist, Rustavora Wallen. Thank welcome, you, welcome. And uh, I'm sure you have a lot to share about your relationship with the Rebbe before and after Gimel Tammuz. Thank you very much for the honor of joining your show today. Uh, the honor is mine, of course, but the day of Gimel Tammuz, just very briefly, is a day when we're experiencing a state of concealment, when we can't hear or see the Rebbe, but a Rebbe is not a simple, ordinary human being. Yes, he's human, but he's a human being who has tremendous spiritual energy, and that spiritual energy defines his existence, and that doesn't ever die. And thinking about what to talk about post Gimbal Tammuz, how do we get guidance from the Rebbe now? We get guidance many different ways. The Rebbe, after the passing of his father-in-law, the previous Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, said that the Rebbe could respond to our questions. He could answer us. How? He'll find a way, go through the roof, go through a window. Of course, he was using those terms metaphorically, that the Rebbe will find ways to respond to us. And the Rebbe prepared us, it seems, for this period when we can't see or hear the Rebbe, that we can get messages from him. And Hasidim have different ways. Hasidim are very creative. One way they do it is by opening up one of the many volumes of the Rebbe's letters. The Rebbe authorized the publishing of his letters. So far, close to 50 volumes, Hebrew, Yiddish, English, have been published, and there's still a lot more that remains to be published. And what people do is they write whatever questions they have, or recite them, say them, and they open up one of the volumes randomly. And believe it or not, they get incredible answers directly to their questions. That's one way that people feel, and it's based on different Jewish sources that that's a, a legitimate thing to do. People feel that that's what one way the Rebbe could respond. And it's interesting that before Gimel Tammuz, the Rebbe encouraged very strongly the publication of those letters. So it's clear that the Rebbe wanted us to consult in those letters. Sometimes we consult just by going to the index and looking for a topic. What does the Rebbe say about this uh, matter, this illness, this uh, spiritual matter? And we, we read those letters. But sometimes we just open up the volumes randomly. And some people go to the Ohel, the resting place. And many, many stories and miracles have happened. I'm going to share a story that I heard from my uh, daughter's father-in-law. In Yiddish, we call that a mechutin. Rabbi Beryl Muchkin from Montreal, a very noted chassid. And I heard this story from someone else, totally unrelated. It was about a young, a non-chassidic Jew who uh, had malignancy. And the doctor said he has to have surgery to remove it. But he, even though he wasn't a chassid, recognized the spiritual power of a tzaddik, of a righteous person. He went to the Rebbe, this is before Gimel Tammuz, and the Rebbe told him not to do the surgery. Well, when did he see the Rebbe? The Rebbe would distribute dollars every Sunday to every man, woman, and child, whoever came with a blessing. And that was an opportunity for him to ask the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says, do not do the surgery. And he listened to his credit. And many years passed, and he was doing fine. And then he contracted or developed another malignant tumor. And this time, the doctors again advised him to do surgery, and he didn't know what to do because the Rebbe told him not to do surgery, but that was then. 
Now it might be a different uh, problem. It, uh, maybe the Rebbe would agree to do the surgery. So he went to the Ohel, and he said his prayers and, and asked for the Rebbe's guidance. And then many people, when they go to the Ohel, after they come out, there's a small little building, and they play a video of the Rebbe. It's, a, it's like a nonstop playing a video of the, any of the Rebbe's talks and his and his uh, interactions with people when he would distribute dollars. And lo and behold, what does he see? He sees the Rebbe telling him not to do surgery. And again, to his credit, he didn't do the surgery. I heard the story from two different sources. So here's a story of before Gimel Tammuz and after Gimel Tammuz. Connecting the both, both Connecting stories. Connecting them together. So you mentioned Montreal, and it reminds me of a post Gimel Tammuz story that happened directly to me that right after Gimel Tammuz, there was a Rebetzin in Montreal, the principal of a high school, and she called me up and she said she would like me to come two weeks from then for Shabbos to do a Shabbaton. At that point, I wasn't running around. I was in Kolel with my husband at that time, and I wasn't traveling, and I said, I'm not sure if I should go. She goes, but the Rebbe already gave you a bracha. I said, ha how is it that I have a bracha? You haven't asked me yet. She goes, well, because it was right after Gimel Tammuz, we wrote a, a letter to the Rebbe from the Hanhala, the administration of the school, asking the Rebbe if we should have a serious event with one of the rabbis in town, or if it should be a Lebedicker for Brangen. And the Rebbe said a Lebedicker for Brangen. And she had mentioned my name and the rabbi's name in this letter. So she said, the Rebbe said, as a Zion, a Lebedicker for Brengen, it should be a lively gathering. And she said, you've got a bracha from the Rebbe, you have to do it. And so I, I made arrangements and I ended up going there. And it was a very successful thing. And I think at that time, people were very distraught and confused. And they didn't know if they're allowed to rejoice. What are we supposed to do? And that was a seemingly very clear answer at the time. So I've had some post Gimel Tammuz things myself. I've seen a lot of them with my practice, people asking questions in these books you're talking about, the Egros Kodesh, the holy letters. Right. And it's a fascinating phenomenon. We're talking a little bit more about Gimel Tammuz. Gimel Tammuz has two other historical events that occurred then that have a direct relationship to the Gimel Tammuz of this generation. The first one is a biblical uh, event when Joshua was conquering the land of Canaan, there was a battle, and it was getting close to sunset, and it would be hard to continue the battle, and he stopped the sun. The sun stopped in his tracks. In other words, he delayed sunset. There were different opinions for how many hours it happened, but this was one of the miracles. And many Hasidim took this to mean that the sun did not set, that even though we couldn't see or hear the Rebbe physically. We couldn't uh, relate to him. But it, We're delaying the, the, sun the sunset. Not set. <laughs> then there's another event that happened much more cl close to our times in the previous Rebbe, who was arrested by the communist regime in 1927 and was originally sentenced to death. Then they commuted the sentence to 10 years in slave labor. Then they commuted that to three years in exile in a city called Kastrama. So when they released him from pr prison to go to Kastrama, it was Gimel, Gimel Tammuz, Tammuz, the third of Tammuz. And the Rebbe referred to that as the beginning of the redemption. The redemption, he was liberated entirely a little over a week later on the 12th and 13th of Tammuz. They were told him about his liberation on the 12th, and he was finally liberated on the 13th. But when did it all begin? When did the liberation begin? On the third of Tammuz. So many Hasidim interpret this to mean that by fact that, that the Rebbe's disappearance, as it were, occurred in Gimel Tammuz, means that planted in that event was, is the mechanism, the dynamic for redemption. That we we see leave. this throughout history, right? There are always the seeds of right. the redemption in right. seemingly you know, confounding uh, experiences for the Jewish people. The, the concealments seem inappropriate, but then all of a sudden you see Things change it. I want to share another story, a post Gimel Tammuz story with the Igros, the Rebbe's letters that I was a witness to myself. I had many such stories. This one is one of my favorite. Uh, we had a young man, married man with a child, who moved to Buffalo. 
And his ambition was, his dream was to become a physical therapist. And he had to support his family, so but he, so, but he still was prepared to go for three years for, through this program. He enrolled in one of the local colleges, I think it was Damon College, and he didn't like the program for whatever reason, and he dropped out of it, and he applied to go to the University of Buffalo, which was a much better program, and it was too late. He applied too late, so they told him, if you apply next year, the odds are you'll get accepted. But then he thought to himself, you know what? I have to support a family. I'm going to, in addition to the three years, I'm going to have to wait a full year, so he decided to... Uh, get a job. Meanwhile, he was a good salesman. And he came to me and he said, you know, I'm not a chassid, I'm not a follower of the Rebbe, but I have great respect. And I heard that chassidim consult the Rebbe in the, in the Rebbe's letters. So he said, he asked me if he could consult with the Rebbe whether he should even bother applying for that spot in the University of Buffalo for a physical therapist. Or perhaps he should give it up and just do whatever else he, he can do to support his family. So I said, be my guest. And uh, I told him where I have the books. It was I had then about 30 volumes of the Rebbe's letters. And I told him where to go. And he goes and he picks a volume randomly. And he opens it up randomly. And he shows me the letter that he opened up to. The letter is where the Rebbe is extolling the virtues of physical therapy <laughs> to someone. And as far as I could tell, I looked... In the, the eleven thousand plus letters that the Reb, that were published, that's the <laughs> no only other one, one focused where the on Rebbe PT. speaks about physical therapy and praises it. Doesn't even doesn't just mention it in passing. Well, uh, he got his answer. The the Rebbe saying he should become a physical, a physical therapist. therapist. He meanwhile he gets a job selling uh, high tech medical equipment and he's doing very well. He was he was a, a real talented salesperson. And now it's already fast forward the next year. And he was accepted. He applied to get into University of Buffalo, and he was accepted. And a few days before he was supposed to start, I asked him, so you're starting uh, physical therapy? He says, no, I'm not. I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm doing very well. I'm selling this medical equipment, and I'm making a very good living. I'm not going to spend three years. I said, I, He's got a bracha I, from I remember the, saying, the I Rebbe. think the Rebbe wants you to be a physical therapist, but I can't force him. I'm not imposing of course myself not. on him. So I meet him a week later. I said, how is, the, uh, how is your, your job going? And he says, oh, I'm in physical therapy. I'm in the program. He says, what do you mean? You told me last week that you're not going to the program. He says, yes, that something funny happened. The day before the program was to begin, I was laid off. <laughs> Apparently, the company wasn't doing very wasn't well. Wasn't doing as well as he, he was doing well, but the company was not, and they laid him off. And he, of course, took the program and he graduated, and he's now a very successful physical therapist in Baltimore, Maryland. Baruch Hashem. So that's, Thank that's God. That's an incredible story. So the Rebbe's the Rebbe's potency is still with us if we request it. Yes, and we need it. But I don't want anyone to think that we're happy with the situation the way it is today. We want to see the Rebbe with our physical eyes because we're down-to-earth human beings and we need a Rebbe that we could relate to physically through seeing him, hearing him, and we believe that with the coming of Mashiach that will happen because we believe very strongly that in the Messianic age those who are no longer here physically will return and especially someone like the Rebbe will be here, will see him, and we'll be able to benefit from him directly, not having to use the indirect methods. These vehicles. These, these the, the various vehicles. All right, let it happen. Bring it on. Bring on the Geula. Right. So that's something that we have to recognize. That it's a little bit of a paradox. On one hand, we, we tell ourselves and tell other people, the Rebbe is here and he's doing miracles and he's guiding us no less, maybe a lot more than before. Uh, whatever restrictions the Rebbe had, time restrictions, uh, location restrictions, no longer exist. So the Rebbe could accomplish a lot more. But nevertheless, this is not what we're... It's not the ideal. It's not the ideal. You could say that with just about everything, that, that you really need the balance. You, you, you need both, you know, in different stages. We can't be satisfied with this situation. 
No, absolutely Let's not. Let's get on with the Geula. Right now, do you have any other stories to tell? It could be before Gimel Talmud. I have before Gimel Talmud stories. I have a story that I think I mentioned to you recently that has to do with you. That there was a point right after college that all I wanted to do was go and study in yeshiva for women. And really all I wanted to do was go to the Holy Land, to Eretz Israel, and there was a particular program. You might remember a girl who used to work here, Esther Berkey, Esther Vlyamovsky. Yes. So Esther had gone to Tzfat, to Machon Alta, and she was thrilled with it and wrote me letters. In those days there was no internet, and that's really all I wanted. I went to some event in Montreal, again Montreal's in our today's conversation, and a Rebbitzin taught me how to write a letter to the Rebbe. There's a certain heading, we have honorifics in the heading, and then to explain my situation, but that I want to go to Crown Heights to get married, or Crown Heights to go study, or the third choice, Israel to, to learn in Machon Alta in Spot. I didn't really want the first two. So we wrote this letter. This was the formal format. I followed her instructions, sent it in. For weeks and weeks, I didn't get any answers. And there was a Fabreng, and it was probably Yud Bez Tammuz, like around this time. And I went, it was at Main Street Chabad House in Buffalo. And you were there translating the Rebbe's talks simultaneously, or while the L'chaims were made, you were giving a summary. And at one of the talks, the Rebbe was speaking about people going from one yeshiva to another yeshiva, or from Israel to America, or America to Israel. And I asked you, did the Rebbe answer my question? And you said, no, he didn't. At that point, they were still making L'chaims. Between talks, the Rebbe would have people in the group make l'chaim, and he would nod to them and make l'chaim with them. So during that singing and that period of rest in between, I went home. Somebody had asked me if I could go home. It was nearby to get a bottle of vodka to continue with the party. So I went home, and my father, I asked him if I could take a bottle of vodka. He said, yes, but we were just in the safe, and your passport is no longer uh, it needs renewal. It's no longer valid, and you can't go to Israel. So I'm thinking, no wonder why I can't get a bracha. <laughs> it would be illegal. I would have no access. So I was devastated. I ran back to Chabad House with that bottle of vodka. The next morning was a Monday. I quickly went to the post office as early as possible, wrote a tear-jerking, tear-soaked letter saying that I need this passport renewed right away, and I gave the, the amount of money and the photograph and all of my form filled out. It was on a Monday. <clears throat> Tuesday was an overnight. They must have received it. Wednesday, there was a ring at the doorbell, and I went to the doorbell. It was the post office giving me this overnight letter. I tore it open, and lo and behold, was my renewed passport. In Buffalo in those days, it would have taken weeks and weeks to get such a thing. You couldn't get it in Buffalo. You'd have to travel to Stamford, Connecticut, or, or New York City to get a passport. And lo and behold, there's my renewed passport. They obviously processed it the same day. Maybe my tear-jerk letter was sufficient. Maybe the Reb is working behind the scenes. I need to be a vessel. I need to fill out the form, give them the photograph, and pay for the, the passport. Well, wouldn't you know it, Moments later, the phone rings, and it's the Lubavitcher Rebbe's office. Rabbi Groner, may he rest in peace, says, Rustavor, you have a blessing from the Rebbe to go to Machon Alta in Svat. So that was a before Gimel Thomas, but I wasn't right in front of the Rebbe. Also, it just shows the power of the Rebbe from a distance, whether the distance is in time or the distance is in space. The Rebbe is present with us wherever we are. There are many people who might be viewing this uh, program. <laughs> She's crazy. <laughs> who, who are not familiar with the Rebbe. Not that many people because the Rebbe is probably the most famous religious Jewish leader of the 20th century, as many people outside of the Hasidic group have said. So I, I just want to talk a little about the Rebbe. If you try to capture the Rebbe in, in one paragraph, it would be impossible. The Rebbe, is so many facets of the Rebbe, that's what makes him so unusual. 
the Rebbe, besides being, in my opinion, the greatest Jewish scholar of this period, and many, maybe of many periods before this, the Rebbe's brilliance is legendary. The Rebbe's memory, uh, incredible, where the famous uh, video where someone who had been with the Rebbe one time and 19 years later, I believe it was 19 years later, they haven't seen each other, and he comes to get a dollar from the Rebbe, and the Rebbe continues the conversation of 19 years earlier, and he likes, he's like amazed, and he says to the Rebbe, you're amazing. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's so interesting how the Rebbe responds to a compliment. Uh, like, most what does it matter? <laughs> you know, I, I know I have a hard time when someone compliments me. And what am I supposed to say? Thank you? Or, oh, no, it's, I don't deserve the compliment. You, 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 it's an awkward time to, to get a compliment from someone. And the Rebbe always used anything that was directed at him to turn it around to challenge you. And the Rebbe Create said, an educational moment. Right, and the Rebbe says, what does... Jewish education benefit from me being a because the Rebbe was talking to about Jewish education. What benefit does anyone have from, from me, me being, being amazing? amazing? <laughs> you know, it's, not, it's irrelevant. You know, the, the Rebbe appreciated the, the compliment, but he appreciated it because he was able to use it to challenge this person to do more. Go forth and be amazing so, yourself. <laughs> so, so, so the Rebbe, that's the Rebbe's memory, and there's so many other stories of the Rebbe's memory of, of texts, of of so people. You're, you're only speaking about scholarship and memory. Right, that's then just the, one, 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 one minor phase, facet. One facet. But if someone would ask me, okay, there's so much about the Rebbe, what do you think is the most, the most powerful aspect of the Rebbe? And I would say it's not the miracles that he performed. It's not even the scholarship. It's the Rebbe's love and leadership based on that love. And there's no parallel to that. I mean, the Rebbe, as I just, we just noted, wrote volumes and volumes of letters to tens of thousands of people. We only have a small fraction of the letters that the Rebbe wrote. The Rebbe actually didn't write most of the letters. He dictated them. And then when they were written up, he edited them. But those are the Rebbe's letters to thousands upon thousands of people just responding to their every problem, So sorrow, many situations. And then people coming to the Rebbe with every pro imaginable problem. Now, any human being who would get, how many letters did the Rebbe get every day? Hundreds of Just letters a day. Just to cope with that. <laughs> Hundreds of letters. And I can guarantee you that of 100 letters, 95 were about ba sad things, were about problems, suffering, pain. And the Rebbe, being such an empathetic person, such a sensitive person, was obviously troubled to no end by all the suffering. The Rebbe would complain that people write to him when they have problems, but when they get better, they forget about writing. To and give them the good news. The Rebbe wanted to hear good news, but anyhow, most of the time he got this bad news, and the Rebbe responded to everyone, each person according to his or her nature and needs. Sometimes two people would write the same question and get totally different answers, because the Rebbe knew each person individually. I, I can tell from the answers I, I got from the Rebbe myself. The Rebbe knew my personality. He knew my strengths and my weaknesses and responded in, in kind. So it's the, the Rebbe's leadership for decades, devoting himself totally to the well-being of the Jewish people and, by, and also to non-Jews. So the people, his love of people and his love of the individual comes out, right. and his ability to tune in. I mean, the ultimate therapist, the right. ultimate social worker who really invests himself in, in the one person. Of, one of the unique things about the Rebbe is the paradoxes of the Rebbe. I wrote a small booklet. I had 68 paradoxes of the Rebbe. One of them is that the Rebbe was a world leader. The Rebbe had connections to presidents, to prime ministers, kings. The king of Morocco, for example, was a very, very, uh, was a chassid in a certain sense. Of, and I'm using it in a very limited sense. He, he respected the Tremendous respect for the Rebbe. And he sent the Rebbe a gift of a rare book that the Rebbe didn't have in his library uh, as one of the examples of that. 
The Rebbe dealt with all sorts of communal leaders, important people, professors and scientists and ambassadors, ambassadors and, and every imaginable. Nation the Rebbe leaders. Was, the Rebbe was com- com- constantly commenting on the situation in Israel. The Israeli government officials had respect for the Rebbe's knowledge of not just political science, but his, uh, his knowledge of the military uh, strategy and things like that. And yet the Rebbe was so connected to individuals. There are so many thousands of stories where the Rebbe had a relationship with individuals. I remember there was a chassid who the Rebbe had, you know, gotten close to through letters. I don't, he, he met the Rebbe also. And this chassid became observant because of the Rebbe's love for him. And I remember he was a very simple Jew, you know, you know just barely literate. And every, and I was in a yeshiva in France, uh, this man, he was the cook. Every few weeks, he got another letter from the Rebbe. And to him, that was the happiest day of his life. Every day he got a letter from the Rebbe. And why would the Rebbe send him a letter and give him so much warmth? If you base it on his importance in the Jewish community, based on his public persona, he wasn't a public person at all. But the Rebbe demonstrated you don't have to be a public person to be valuable and be important. The Rebbe treasured every individual and every aspect of that individual. Uh, I, I remember two stories like that. I remember one where a letter fell down and people went to grisp, grab it and the Rebbe himself bent down to pick it up. And then another one where one of the secretaries withheld, because the Rebbe was not well, it was after his heart attack, they withheld a pile of letters, and the Rebbe asked where all the letters were. The Rebbe could feel that, that he needed to connect with those people, and that each person was important. Another Montreal story, a young man who was an orphan, uh, and who had, I think, certain uh, deficits. The Rebbe sh- tr- showed him tremendous love and affection, and he was not well physically as well, he passed away very young. The Rebbe told him to write a letter and report everything he does every, let's say, so bizarre, often. every every, uh, every two weeks, something like that. And in the beginning, he was able to do that. But after a few months went by, he had nothing new to write. His schedule was the same. I woke up in the morning, I washed my hands, I, I brushed my teeth, I went to the school, to the yeshiva, I studied for an hour. So he, one week, when the letter was due, he didn't write. He stopped. The next day, he gets a call from the Rebbe secretary. The Rebbe wants to know why, did you, why you why didn't did send he... a letter. The Rebbe got hundreds of letters every day. So he told the Rebbe, he responded through the Rebbe secretary, that I had nothing to write about. So the Rebbe says, okay, if you can't write every two weeks, write every week. The Rebbe was literally uplifting this person, giving him something to live for. The highest, a meaning, a meaning in his life. Right. That, that gave him so much energy and so much that showed how much the Rebbe thought about him and cared for him. There are just thousands of stories like that with the Rebbe's sensitivity to even one individual. So when we tell stories of the Rebbe, miracle stories, the greatest miracle is the Rebbe's love. Because to, to, for a person to devote his life, the Rebbe was an introverted person by nature. The Rebbe himself said that to someone. He, he has to work on himself every day to not be introverted. And the Rebbe was the most extroverted person I know. You, you would think so. Right. The, the Rebbe was constantly reaching out to people, helping people, speaking to people. The Rebbe spoke thousands of thousands of hours of Torah teachings. But we know that's a quality in Hasidus. If you've got a tendency that may be a deficit you work in the opposite direction. Well, that's the Rambam's uh, right. Hilchos that, Deus. You work to get to the middle. That's one of, the, to one of the many to... paradoxes of the Rebbe. The Rebbe is the most introverted and most extroverted at the same time. And these stories are really, I think, they capture more the Rebbe's essence than the miracle stories. But we like to tell miracle stories because miracle stories help us recognize that there's a God in this world. And that's one of the Rebbe's major objectives, if not the major objective, to bring the divine into this world, to bring about the messianic age. What, what are we working for? What are we striving for to, to, when we do a mitzvah, when we do one mitzvah? Is that the end? No, it's not the end. That's the mechanism through which we bring about 
bringing God into this world and making the world the ideal, perfect, messianic world that God created it in order to become eventually. So uh, every time we tell a miracle story, it gives us more awareness of the fact that God is controlling the world. And the truth is, every person could perform a miracle. The Rebbe told someone, everyone could perform a miracle. A miracle doesn't have to be where you cure an, a sick person. A miracle could be when you change and transform yourself. That's also a miracle. Some people can do even more uh, astounding miracles. Uh, and Many thousands of miracle stories are told about the Rebbe. So you're, t you're talking about the individual attention that the Rebbe gives to people and how he gets to know our personalities uniquely. And I told you that story right after Gimel Tom was about how I was asked to do the Shabbaton because the Rebbe said it should be a Lebedicker for Brengen. So this audience may not know unless they know who I am, but I'm a Lebedicker. Uh, you know, for many years. Yes. And so when I was a single woman, single girl, Right after the Rebbitzin passed away, at that time the Rebbe spoke in Tavshin Memchas, 1988, the Rebbe spoke about birthdays and hakels. It was a hakel year. What is hakel? Hakel is this year also the eighth of the seven year cycle where the king would gather the people and tell the Torah to the, the Jewish people in public. But it means gathering, and the Rebbe emphasized on this eighth year that we should have gatherings. So he was specific, after the Rebbitson passed away, to make birthday gatherings, birthday hakels. And he spoke about what the content should be. There should be a word of Torah, charity, tzedakah being given, etc. Uh, hachlatos, uh, good resolutions for the future, should be made at those parties. So that was the first year I made my birthday hakel. It happens, and you spoke about Gimel Tammuz. So what started Gimel Tammuz was Tesvav Sivan, the day the previous Rebbe went into prison. So it happens that there's a minor Hasidic holiday. Do Hasidim celebrate the days that their Rebbes went into prison as well as came out? So that year, the Rebbe was not at 770 at his synagogue. He was giving talks from his home briefly when there was an occasion, and he was saying his prayers from the home on President Street. The Rebbe was saying all of his prayers from his home and took every opportunity to give a talk. Well, Tesvav Sivan is a minor Hasidic holiday, and he gave the talk. So we all went upstairs to listen to the hookup at, at uh, Racha Aleya Shalom Pinson's house. We listened to the hookup, and the Rebbe was speaking, and everybody knew there was going to be dollars. So after the talk, we all walked up to President Street to the Rebbe's house, and I brought my birthday hakel. There were like 10 girls. One of them stayed home. She couldn't walk so far. And she said, please include us in whatever the Rebbe says. So I told them, let's stay together. If someone needs to come through, push them ahead of us, push them behind us, tell them we're in a group. And lo and behold, now the whole time, I don't know why I did this, Rabbi, you would have advised me differently. The whole way on the way to the Rebbe's house, I'm practicing a phrase in Yiddish. Don't ask why I insisted on speaking Yiddish. I could have said, Rebbe, today is my birthday, Hakel, and these are my friends. I'm practicing, Heint is mein Geburtstag, and das is mein Hakel von Geburtstag. Das is a chalik, because one of the girls was at home. Von mein Geburtstag. I don't know why I did this to myself. I got up to the Rebbe and I did this thing, and I'm presenting my girlfriends to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe looks at me and starts talking in Yiddish. And I'm like disoriented. Not that I knew much Yiddish, but I just heard words like word salad. I heard hakel, simcha, you friends. I I I I I did not. I did not understand what he said. I start walking away, and Esther Rebbitson Sternberg says, Rooster Boy, the Rebbe's still talking to you. She pulls me back to the Rebbe, and I'm listening, I'm listening. I'm, I can't really contain myself. You know, as they say, I'm in Shvira Sakalim, my, my vessel is exploding. I don't know what's going on. And he stops, and I say, Oh, man, okay, like, good enough. So I walk, and the Rebbe gives everybody her bracha. And when they get outside, they're like, Rustavor, what did the Rebbe say? I have no idea. He said, 
something about parties. He said, be besimcha. He said, with my friends. And I said, I think you're all going to get married very soon. I just made that up. Okay. The next day, we went back to the hakel. We sang, we fabracht. It was fun. Everybody had her dollar and her bracha. We got an extra dollar for the girl who stayed home. The next day, I'm in my office at Rabbi Hecht's office, and there's a phone call. Rabbi Klein, all of a sudden, knew where I worked. He said, did you hear what the Rebbe told you last night? I said, not really. He said, the Rebbe told you, you need to make hakels. I said, birthday hakels? He said, no, with those friends, you need to make parties. So the Rebbe knows I'm a party girl. I said, but when? It's the end of the year, right? Gimel Thomas, it's now. Uh, Test of Sivan, it's now. How, how, they're all going to camp or home or to jobs. Shlichus, how am I going to make parties? He said, you'll figure it out. The Rebbe told you to make parties. A few minutes later, I get a call from Esther Sternberg. She goes, Rooster Vork, get a pen. Take a pen and write this down. Now, I didn't really understand it when she said it, but she translated it. I, I thought I'm in conversation with you. Sorry, I thought you know a little Yiddish. I know a little, yeah. A little, a missile. So he said, Ir zol manen, you need to demand. Aze zolen das ton, they need to do this thing. Ze zolen eich anleiden zu zeer bazundere hakel. They're going to invite you to their individual hakels. You need to party with them like they partied with you. Rebbe knows my personality. He, he got me down pat. And lo and behold, I said, how are we going to pull this off? When she told me, I, I called all those friends. We didn't have WhatsApp. It was, it was a little more difficult. I called all those and I said, Rebbe wants us to have parties for the next couple of weeks before I go to the Ivy League Torah study program. And three of those girls were Madri hosts for me in the program. I was directing the program that year. I said, you girls are going to make your party there. We don't have time to make 10 parties in a, a, it was like seven days. There was Shabbos and Shabbos and, and lo and behold, one was at the park, one was in someone's basement, one was in someone's house. And we partied for literally a week and a half until we got to the program, and then we partied again. So you're talking about how the Rebbe is so intimately aware of each neshama and their qualities or their essence or whatever. Twice the Rebbe told me, go party. Have a Lebedicker for Brengen. Make for Brengen and with your friends, Hakels, and be Lebedic. Yeah, I like to share a story that happened before Gimel Tamos when the Rebbe would give dollars. Well, we... We're raising children in Buffalo, New York. It's not exactly the most concentrated Jewish. Oh, this is not the. I, they told me that this is the best place to live. This is not Jerusalem. A religious Jew. <laughs> it's not Jerusalem or. They or, duped me, Rabbi. You duped me to come here. Or Borough Park, and we always worry about if our kids are going to get the best Jewish education possible. So we we wanted to ask the Rebbe for a blessing for them, which we could have done by mail, but we thought since we go to. Prown Heights to be by the Rebbe every now and then, that we're going to ask it in person. And, you know, when you described going by the Rebbe to get dollars, you have to realize that there were thousands of people there. And if you really stood there and had a discussion with the Rebbe, you were number one keeping the Rebbe standing. The Rebbe, yes. when he gave the dollars, he would stand the entire time. No break for anything, not a glass of water, not a bathroom break, not a sit down. The Rebbe's in his late 80s. And he didn't the, want to impose on the, the Rebbe. And the Rebbe was giving the thousands of people dollars and blessings, looking at every person. And when the Rebbe looked at every person, he, he, he saw you who you really are. And every extra few seconds that you stood there meant that the Rebbe would have to stand not six, seven hours, but eight hours, nine hours. And then with thousands of people waiting online. So you had to be very, very succinct. Very succinct, very quick. And and if you get nervous, because it's very easy to get nervous when you're in the presence of such a great person, uh, nothing comes out of your mouth. So I decided my wife is going to be the one to ask the Debbie for the blessing, <laughs> not me. So... Uh, my wife is planning and really looking forward to the time when she could stand in front of the Rebbe and ask for a blessing for our children. A few days before we went to New York, we got a call from someone in the community that his mother was ill. So as Rebbe's emissaries, 
our, our job is to think about the well-being of our community. You can't abandon ship. Right. So we decided that my wife is going to ask for a blessing for that woman. But you can't ask for two things because there's not enough time. It, it, it wouldn't be right. We'd have to postpone it for another time. So she, while she's waiting online, she's thinking to herself, oh, I would love to be able to ask the Rebbe <laughs> for a bracha for our children. And, but I'm not going to because this woman is in need of a blessing and I'm going to ask for her. So she comes in front of the Rebbe and she said, I want to ask for a blessing for a fool, for a recovery, for so-and-so. And the Rebbe answers, Amen. And she walks away. That's it. And when you walk away from the Rebbe, you don't walk with your back to the Rebbe, of course. So the Rebbe turns to her with a smile, says to her, you should have a lot of nachas from them. That's a blessing you give for children. Nachas means pleasure and satisfaction from your children. Beautiful. So here the he Rebbe, knew, was on the Rebbe knew what she was thinking of and that she sacrificed her opportunity to ask for a blessing because she's concerned about another Jew. And the Rebbe responded to that by giving her that blessing that she it wanted. It reminds me of that story of the person who accidentally was flustered and gave a shopping list to the Rebbe. And the, the, the letter with all the questions that he had had right. was still in his pocket or something like well, that. My mother-in-law, blessed memory, when she first came to the Rebbe, I think the first time, uh, it's customary when you would have an audience with a Rebbe, you would write down your name and your mother's name and your family members' names and ask for a blessing. You would put it in writing. Why it's done in writing is, is we can discuss some other time. The simple reason is that you shouldn't forget. <laughs> so anyhow, she gives the Rebbe the note with all the names of her seven children, her name, her husband's name, and seven children. And the Rebbe says, you left out one of your sons. <laughs> and the Rebbe mentions the son by name. And the Rebbe adds that to the list. What happened was, a mother wouldn't leave out a name of a child, but she wrote the names quickly, and then she rewrote it to make it more neat. And when she rewrote it, she left she out one name, one, one name. <laughs> and the Rebbe, of course, knew everyone's, everyone's name and was able to note that she left something out. So that's, we're, that's, we're, so, we're so blessed to know that the Rebbe takes defined attention for each individual. Right. Just talking about stories of, of the Rebbe. Uh, there's a story that happened, again, to show the Rebbe's sensitivity. My brother, my younger brother, Yosef Yitzchak. You're going to tell the matzah story? Yes, that's the matzah tell story. Tell the matzah story. Right. When he was about 14 years old, the Rebbe had a custom that every Erev Pesach, the day before Passover, in the afternoon, they bake special matzah, and the Rebbe would get a certain amount of matzah and distribute it to every person who would stand on line until the holiday began. And people who had to travel would go a little earlier, and they would get the matzah. And then my brother would, was staying with my parents in Patterson, New Jersey, and uh, it's about an hour. Then it was about an hour tri trip. So he comes to the Rebbe. The Rebbe gives him a piece of matzah, and my brother very naively, innocently <laughs> says, "Can I have one from my father?" The Rebbe gives him another piece. Can I have one from my mother? <laughs> another piece. Can I have one from my grandfather? Another piece. From my sister. From my my brother. I don't know how. I think about six, seven pieces. And the Rebbe very patiently, even though the Rebbe's standing for hours. And Just give him a box. <laughs> and the Rebbe gave him a piece for every mem family member. When he came home to my parents, my father was very upset. He says, why did you trouble the Rebbe? One piece would have been enough. It's a symbolic piece. I mean, it's not enough to fulfill your obligation of eating matzah. We could have just broken it into smaller pieces and given everyone. So my brother felt very guilty. Next year, he made a resolution. I'm going to ask for. I'm not going to ask for anything. Piece. I'll get one piece and run. <laughs> does it does. So the Rebbe gives him a piece, and the Rebbe says, "What about your father, father and your mother, your mother and your grandfather <laughs> and your brother and your sister?" And the, with a with a smile, and the Rebbe sensed the tension that he had in him, and the Rebbe wanted to say, "Don't worry. Don't worry. It was not, okay. It's not so bad. It's okay." <laughs> Our it was, Rebbe. It was done in innocence. The Rebbe loved the innocence of people, of children in particular. The love. It was one story where a kid 
apparently thought, was walking the street, thought that this, the Rebbe was his father. So he goes up to the Rebbe's kapata, and I think he wiped his hands on it. Oh. And the Rebbe didn't say anything or do anything. And then after Shabbos was over, the mother, when she heard about it, she was, she was beside herself. So she writes to the Rebbe, I apologize. I hope that, you know, it's not... Didn't disturb the Rebbe. And the Rebbe writes back, why do you have to apologize? This is such a... I'm not using the exact word. This is so beautiful. If only adults would have the innocence, the purity of, of a child. The Rebbe cherished that that the kid did something of such innocence. And that's one of the things about the Rebbe's focus on Mashiach. Mashiach is, 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 is uh, the Talmud says, every, every one of us has, no, actually the Baal Shem Tov said, every one of us has a spark of Mashiach in us. But the Talmud says that children specifically are called Mashiach. Why are children called Mashiach? Because Mashiach, the Messiah, is someone who's, in touch with the very essence of his soul. Sincere, completely. The essence, the, the most pure, the most innocent aspect of your soul. And Mashiach is that way totally. And who has that innocence more than anyone else? Children. So every child, we all have that spark in us, but the children have it in a much more revealed way. And the Rebbe, whose focus was Mashiach, more than anything else, wanting to bring the world to its state of redemption, cherished innocence of children and, and when it's found in an adult as well, of course. I guess that's why he told me to party. <laughs>